Um, my question to you is, do you believe that there's a direct link between Christianity and conservatism? Um, so that's a good question. So let me answer it differently first. I get the question, Charlie, can I be a conservative without being a Christian? Of course you can, yes. Uh, you're welcome aboard as long as you believe in the natural law, liberty, and freedom. You know, you believe in our core tenets. But I do not believe you can have a cogent conservative worldview or philosophy without at least first theism and definitely without some sort of biblical view. You can't. Um, because you're always going to be deriving it back to what standard, what moral worldview, what basis. Now, said differently, you could be an atheist. If you're an atheist here tonight, God bless you. <laughs> Glad you're here. Um, and no, seriously, I mean that. And you could believe everything that I believe politically. I would just probably say you derived it from a theistic Christian worldview, if that makes sense. So um, do I think they're linked together? So let me say this. I think if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you should be a conservative as well. You know, conserving the good, the true, and the beautiful, protecting the vulnerable, those that can't protect themselves, using strength to protect the weak, not the strength to crush the weak, all these things that conservatives believe. At the same time, I do believe in a movement that is not only for Christians because we live in a pluralistic society of differences of opinions. I'm always going to own the fact that I'm a Christian as evidenced by inviting Frank right up, you know, to just witness for you at the beginning. He did a great job, didn't he? That was great. He really did. But it is a movement where we are trying to fight for liberty. You might think liberty is just an accident of evolution. I think liberty is God's idea, not man's idea. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, so honestly, I just wanted to ask how your wife and baby are doing. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Baby is nine weeks today, praise God, and we're, we're very happy. She's doing wonderful. Thank you. I think they're watching right now, so, uh, and it changes your life in every way possible. Highly recommend. 10 out of 10. You should do it. So, God bless you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, to address your previous assertion that uh, race means nothing, Critical race theory is not being taught in schools. It is a academic theory that's pretty much delegated only to higher academia. They are not teaching it in schools. Your explanation of it was an oversimplification. You address the real history behind it, unlike most people. And why, if race means nothing, does it affect our history? Say 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Why is there such evil history with something that supposedly means nothing? Okay, so first of all, you're wrong. It is being taught in elementary schools. So I'll give you an example. Not only is it being taught, it's being enforced. So in Denver, there is a playground where they say white families not allowed. Would you support that? That seems like a ridiculous edge case. So I'll give you another example. Actually, in the National Education Association's training manual, which is the largest teacher union in the country, they had a seminar on how to teach critical race theory to kids. That sounds like it's in our schools, doesn't it? What, what that is, is it's literally just common sense. It's saying that this is real history. This is what has happened in the past. Right. So what that matters. Okay, got it. So, for example, do you, would you say that black-only dormitories is wrong? It certainly creates a sense of community. I don't see any problem with that. We have sororities. We have male-only dorms. Right. So racial differences are irrelevant and immaterial. Chromosomal differences actually do matter. But let me ask you a question. Are there differences between races? No, not biologically. Then why would we have different dormitories for races? Culture. Segregation is what you're arguing for, my friend. No, sir. No, sir. How, how is it not segregation to have blacks in their own dorm? You've just, you've just pigeonholed me, essentially. You've essentially just like, you've distracted from my original argument. No, no, you, you did that to yourself. Let's reemphasize. So, okay, so okay. Ibram X. Kendi argues, who is one of the leading thinkers of critical theory, race theory, discrimination today to atone for discrimination of yesterday. We have black-only graduation ceremonies at Columbia University, black-only dormitories across the country, for example, at Western Washington University. Can you join me today in saying... Black-only dormitories are evil, wrong, and it's segregation. You still haven't answered my question about why does this history simultaneously mean nothing? Well, I'm happy to also, answer that, but the fact you're dodging segregation in America, why is that? I'm arguing against, I'm arguing against segregation. So you're against black-only dormitories? Yes. Well, you said it was a force of community, and then for your not-for-critical race That's theory— That's an option. We have choice. Oh, so you could choose to segregate— 
That's that's a pigeonhole. You're what do you think of white only dormitories? What? Would you support white only dormitories? Everybody has a choice. So I think white only and black only anything is evil and wrong. That's why I hate critical theory and critical race theory because when it's Which put in practice, when it's put in practice, you start to discriminate people based on race. So we're now south of the Mason-Dixon line in North Carolina. We did a lot of work to get rid of segregation in this country. Why are you trying to bring it back? What work? Um, the, National, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In this state? Uh, yeah, actually in this state. <laughs> are there black only bathrooms out there I'm unaware of or white only bathrooms? Nah. Right, a lot of work was done in this state. <laughs> Fuck you, your, your face is small. Well, thanks for being here. They always go to insults when they lose the argument. God bless you, my friend. All right, next one. I don't have an edgy race question. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> but my question is, when 63% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, not even able to afford a home, car, or even basic necessities, when wages have only increased 15% since 1965, while the cost of a home has increased 118%, how does free market neoliberal capitalism address these issues when free market capitalism breeds these very issues? So I probably agree with part of that. I would reject the neoliberal because I'm not a neoliberal, I believe. The economy is neoliberal. You're not neoliberal. Well, no, actually, the economy is partially neoliberal. Um, so you how agree? is it not neoliberal? Um, part of our trade policy. Part of our trade policies have recently yes, not we're been global we are globalized. We embrace globalization. That is neoliberal. I, I, you're getting way ahead of yourself, dude. Like you're at like a ten. You got to slow down to like a six. Okay, I'm All here. Right. To, I, I talk. I'm listening. Okay, good. All right. So, how would free market capitalism fix part of this? Yes. Well, the answer is that there are externalities of free market capitalism. Markets should serve people. People should not serve markets. I would say generally, some of the facts that you cited are totally correct. I talked about the destruction of the American middle class. Some of that can be attributed to bad government policy. Hopefully you and I can agree that the government being able to create money out of thin air crushes the American middle class and creates a tax called inflation where every single working person in this room is one month poor despite working harder this year. That is because of government, not because of free market capitalism, that inflation is running out of control. We spent $5 trillion we don't have on pet projects that were silly and awful and terrible. To your point though, and I actually can agree, and I am not a neoliberal, is I actually think that our economic policy needs to be done prudently, not ideologically, in the sense of we should make more stuff here, we should protect the muscular class, we need to have our own industrial base, immigration should serve the American citizen, both legal, and we should have no illegal immigration, we should have a moratorium on legal immigration until wages go up and American workers and students are put first and given a preference. But I would say this though, there are some market forces that could be generally really good, okay? And just throwing away all markets in kind of one sentence and just kind of dismissing it, I think would be a catastrophic mistake. I'll give you some examples. I'm not anti-market. Okay, good. I'm glad you clarified that. But I'd say that generally the ability to be able to trade across state lines for small businesses to start new products, for family-owned business to pass down one family to the other without these crazy taxes and estate taxes. These are things I would support. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, but that's not free market capitalism then. Okay, well, it depends how you define it, right? So do you mean laissez-faire, no government interference? Well, no, it doesn't have to be laissez-faire. It's just that's not free market if you're only restricting jobs to America. It's not free market. Okay, well, actually it is because Adam Smith, the author of Wealth of Nations, yes. was a protectionist. Abraham Lincoln was a protectionist. So the original free market thinkers of the 1700s and 1800s, including Alexander Hamilton, they were free markets, but they were also nationalists. They wanted their country to be able to thrive and succeed because markets should serve people in the country. People in the country should not serve markets. That's my position economically. Markets are a general good for society. We should only intervene prudently when we see externalities that start to harm people or wages go down or there are results that we don't like in that regard. Thank you for your question and thanks for being here tonight. Hey, Charlie, first of all, I want to just say thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for speaking, uh, and thank you for giving other people a chance to speak. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was actually on something you said earlier, how you said the question of hierarchy is not necessarily that to get rid of elites, but to just have better elites. Mm -hmm. The argument I would counter, and I just want to know your thoughts, is the way I see hierarchy is you can have terrible people at the top, theoretically, people that are working in their own best interest, people that are corrupt, you know. And yes, that will affect the people at the bottom, but the way I've always seen hierarchy 
especially in America and some of the stuff I see today, uh, kind of goes back to what he said with lower wages. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Um, what is your opinion on the idea that hierarchy should be designed more so around just making sure the people at the bottom benefit, regardless of whether or not the elites are necessarily corrupt? Well, yeah, that's a nice goal, but how, that didn't really work well in the 20th century. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna comment on that in that some of the most prosperous points of America, a lot of people like to think back to it, things like the 60s and 70s. For sure. You had a very corrupt American elite. You had an American elite that was starting foreign wars. That was after World War II where the defense industry mm, I was I would disagree. Was I think Eisenhower big. was a pretty ethical president compared to I'm not saying the, that an the individual, gang of criminals we deal with now. I'm not saying an individual president can't okay, be that's fair. An, an, a non-ethical person. I'm yeah, but would you agree the 50s economic policy was more focused on the middle class than the lower class, right? Because it was about a, a, an industrial base. It was about making stuff here abroad. It was about having trade policies that allowed us to be able to flourish and succeed. So the question, so you're always going to have high, you agree we're always going to have hierarchies. Yeah, oh, right? absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah, unavoidable. Yeah, okay, good. Because a pure Marxist would say we eventually can get rid of them. I think that's woefully utopian. Yeah. But the question is then when you design a system, who should it serve? Aristotle would argue the middle class is everything. I totally agree, right? It's the people that don't commit crimes, they pay their taxes, right? They're not going to get fabulously wealthy in their lifetime, but they should be able to have a commitment to retirement, see their life improve, their kids should be able to get well educated and live a nice and normal life and the society should be stabilized around that, right? When that middle class disappears and you get a permanent government addicted class too much on the bottom or you get too much of an oligarchy on top, then I think the entire system starts to shatter. So I think we're saying the same things in some ways, but my argument is that you're always gonna have hierarchies and I would love to be able to see leaders in the top of the hierarchy, the billionaire class, if you will, pander less to the needs, wants, and interests of some esoteric climate change propaganda from the World sure. Economic Forum and instead say, hey, I have a lot of money. How am I going to use that money to benefit people's freedom and liberty and middle, middle class potential? Not trying to turn off our energy supremacy or superiority, which is the dumbest thing and actually hurts middle income Americans and make your energy bills even more expensive, if that makes sense. So I guess you would probably agree then that kind of the difference between the 50s and now is that the middle, cra middle class has kind of been ground down on the yeah, totem pole. Yeah, intentionally, I think. Okay. Yeah. So then, and, yeah. We and I think it's a variety agree. of things. I think public policy. I think Wall Street's taken over our government. But also, I, I will say this. I don't agree with libertarians on a lot of stuff, but they are totally right on monetary policy. Our monetary policy has been a robbery campaign of the American middle class, of destroying the American dollar, of depleting our purchasing power since the 1950s. So, for example, in the 1950s, your dollar just went further than it does now. It yeah. did. It did. And that destroys middle income earners and is a rigged game against working people. Got to yeah. get to the next question. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate no it. Problem. Thank you. What's up? Um, so my question is, given that 97% of scientists agree that man-made climate change is, exists and that it will cause negative impacts in our lifetime from more severe storms to droughts, how do you as a conservative deal with that fact and what do you want to do to address it? Sure. I'm really curious about the 3%, aren't you? Yeah, I guess like, I don't know, like 3% of people think that it, they can fly, but they can't. You yeah, know? But it's 3% of scientists. Why do they think it's not anthropogenic? I don't think about the 3%, I think about the 97%. Is science like, just a democracy? Like how we think about you know, 97% of people who are struggling day to day. We don't think about the 1% as well, much. Well, hold on, as that's not the way science works. Do we take an up or down vote on Newtonian physics? Does, who thinks force equals mass times acceleration? It's irrelevant, because we can prove it. Yeah, but there's still like 2% of scientists that are probably nuts who don't agree with that, right? No. No? I mean, if we poll them, you, we can always find a nut. Why do we have to You, you, you think 2% of American physicists would say that force equal does not equal mass times acceleration or would reject, reject Newtonian physics or the second law of thermodynamics? I, 2 or 3% of people think that they can fly, you know? They're yeah, but they're not scientists. Insane. <laughs> and I don't think 2 or 3% of people could fly, think they can fly. I don't think that's exactly right. The point is this. Science is not a democracy, is it? Um, no, absolutely not. So what do you where do you think that 97% comes from? Well, first of all, the study is flawed in and of itself. It's government funded. It's way overquoted. Let's pretend it's right, though, okay? You go through this, people are incentivized to come to certain conclusions. But I'm fascinated by the 3%. The 3%, the 2%, the 1%, the dissenter in science is always given a platform. That's what the scientific method is all about. In fact, prior to Galileo, we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. And then Galileo was like, no, actually, it's the heliocentric theory. You know what happened to Galileo? Tried and put in prison and out to pasture because he dared disagree with the status quo and the scholastic belief. History is not very kind to the overwhelming, tyrannical nature 
of scientists that say 97% of us agree that lobotomies work until we realize they don't. Now, you might be right. It might be man-made. It might be anthropogenic. But that 3% has a lot of credence. You should look at them. Read their journals. They argue that there's thousands of other explanations for rising global temperatures other than just carbon emitted from human beings. Sunspots, global tilt, natural cooling and heating patterns. And just to say it's all human beings all the time also it begs the question, to what extent, what do you do about it, and what are you willing to then sacrifice? So real quick, you can actually check charts online that show you the, the graphs of how sunspots tend to affect temperatures in the United States. Te um, sunspots, volcanic eruptures, all this stuff. And all of it doesn't count for, account for the amount of difference that we've seen recently. So what do you say to that? Depends on what scientists you talk to. That's it, what it's no, all no, about. It's not, it's not the science, the scientist. It's just the science itself. Like if you check graphs on any website. So show me a single scientist that can tell me without a shadow of a doubt, empirically proven, that man-made carbon emissions is solely to blame. And to what blame and what is the equation? And then what can we possibly do about it? So this is a question, right? No, again, I'm not saying it, anyone is solely to blame. I'm just saying that humans are a big factor. And that's what, what most people Define believe. big. What's the number big? Um, I couldn't give you that exact number. Well, then maybe we shouldn't shut down the entire economy and change our energy sector over a number we can't define. Or, or maybe I'm just a college. Right? I mean, we're talking about but Europe. But I'm just saying maybe I'm just a college student who doesn't have that number. No, that's them. fine. But now we're talking about shutting down Europe and having an entire green energy obsession making. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm, saying no, no, no. But you are saying is when you start engaging in green energy fantasy or climate change fanaticism, let me call it that, you're going to have serious ramifications. The United Kingdom could be a net energy exporter. Instead, this winter, they're going to have rolling blackouts. They're going to have people potentially dying from blizzards and from incredible cold. Why? Because they've had this entire green energy propaganda campaign that is making themselves intentionally poor because of a community of scientists that are saying we must shut ourselves down because of anthropogenic, human-made, man-made cause climate change. Ask the question, wait a second, what if the premise itself is faulty? And by the way, 97% of scientists were also saying, yeah, the COVID vaccine is the best thing ever. Ivermectin is awful and terrible. So excuse me while I'm just the dissenting contrarian voice, which says the scientific community, whether it be in climate alarmism or in COVID vaccines or in epidemiology, I won't trust Anthony Fauci in epidemiology, nor will I trust his equivalent in climate change alarmism. In fact, I've grown to custom to believe there's probably agenda, an agenda behind a lot of this stuff. Yeah, for sure. You should never trust... For sure, you should never trust just one scientist. And that's why I'm saying we should probably trust the 97% who say that. I'm really glad science is not a democracy. Otherwise, we would be in a very dark place. Always listen to the dissenting voice. That 3% is well-researched. It's in the minority. It's been suppressed. And that 97% figure has been used now to really restrict Western energy dominance. It's making us poor and making the elite stronger because of it. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, um, I just wanted to real quick ask you, uh, can you clarify your definition of critical race theory? Uh, yeah, Derek Bells. So what he wrote in 1991, Intro to Critical Race Theory. What's in that book? The whole book is your definition. Um, how about this? Oh, the one I used, call everything racist till you control it. Oh, so wait, but then that literally means that critical race theory can mean basically anything you want it to, right? Like can, Only can if I you're calling like it racist till you control it. I mean, I'm defining critical race theory in the modern American context as that. We can go back to Herbert Marcuse, One Dimensional Man, or Jacques Derrida, or Michel Foucault, but the most agreed upon legal, no, I'm sorry, the most agreed upon academic theory is Intro to Critical Race Theory, 1991 by Derrick Bell. Yeah. Wait, but... Are you familiar with that literature? Well, yeah, I read the book, but I don't remember anything about it. It was for, like, a college class. Like, let's be honest. Nobody remembers the books they read in college. Um, Sounds like a great value proposition to go to nah, college. No, no, no. It is. Trust me. <laughs> but, like, uh, well, but you didn't go to college, so I guess you wouldn't know. Um, it's true. I didn't. So, so let me ask you, though, does that mean that I'm not able to have this conversation with you? Because I no. actually remember the book, and you didn't, and you paid hey. for it. <laughs> So, 
first of all, I didn't pay for it. Uh, there's these things called scholarships. Oh, so somebody else so, paid for you not to yes. remember the book exactly. that you're supposed to read. Oh, Anyways. some wealthy donor or taxpayer paid for you hey, to not remember the book. I have a question. Um, who are your wealthy donors? Many of them are in this room. Thank you guys for your wonderful support, by the way. Interesting. We have over 130,000 grassroots donors at Turning Point USA, 130,000. I think we have some people in the back that chip in $5, $10, $15. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We are a grassroots funded operation. But let me give you another example. I'll give you five things that critical race theory believes. Number one, the notion that racism is ordinary and everywhere. Number two, the idea of interest convergence, otherwise known as intersectionality. Number three, the social construction of race meaning that there is a social construction around race in our society. The four, idea of storytelling and counter story, storytelling. Number five is that no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you do, you cannot remove racism from your society. Those are five pillars of critical race theory based on Derek Bell's Intro to Critical Race Theory. Does that, does that ring a bell? Um, yes, but like, okay, so let me stick with this. Um, what do you think... We'll edit that out. My Don't train. Worry. Oh, oh, my bad. Wait, am I not allowed to? It's not encouraged. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, what was the third point? My mind is dying. The social construction of race. The social construction of race. Do you not think that race is uh, at least partially socially constructed? Depends how you define it. So, like, what defines where one race ends and where one race begins? Depends who you're asking. I think race is completely and totally irrelevant. Do you think race is relevant? No. Okay, then why are we talking about race all the time, and why are we talking about critical race theory? Well, you brought it up at first when you were doing your speech. Right, so, remember I said it was a lie from the pit of hell that we should repudiate and stop talking about all the time? <laughs> you're, you're on scholarship? Sorry, what? Nothing, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, to answer your question, I don't think that race means anything, and I guess you don't either, right? Yeah. Right, so then why do you keep bringing up race whenever you are on or speaking on a stage? I am not speaking on a stage bringing up critical race theory. You no, are. No, no, no. So. I'm bringing up how critical race theory destroys society and how we shouldn't talk about race all the time. Okay, but you're bringing up race. No, no, critical race theory, not race. Okay, so... What's the second word in that? Yeah, it's race, but it's a theory of how to view race, of which is a mind virus pathogen destroying America, of which I said again, just to reemphasize for those in the back, we could replay the tape, we could throw the red flag, to we'll watch it over again. I said that what? Race means nothing. I care about your actions, your character, and most importantly, your soul. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. So I'm not really asking much of a question, but uh, I'm looking for advice. Uh, I want to run for Congress uh, in a few years uh, when I become of age. And I'm just wondering if you have any pointers or direction you can help guide me. You should run. We need more young people to run. Uh, we have Turning Point Action, which is not represented here tonight, which is our political arm that would love to help you and train you and pour into you. Um, it's an amazing organization that's doing such awesome things. Knock on more doors than your opponent. Have a message that resonates to voters. Respect your elders and talk to people that have been in politics for a while and listen to them. I don't like when young people run for office and they don't listen to people that have been around for a while. They've really cut their teeth. They've been through a lot. It's something that I had to learn the hard way, hard way early on and really be like, okay, what did you learn through this? What happened in this cycle and all that? They have a lot of wisdom to pass down. And I think you're going to be very welcomed and well-received as a younger candidate. I mean that. Thank you. God bless you. Thank God you. Bless you. Hey, Charlie. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm actually uh, the president of the chapter at University of South Carolina. Uh, so I was actually uh, at uh, CLS this summer, you know, where you said chapters change the world, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, I was just asking you, so we had our fall semester come by. It's now, it's October now, and we had a big crop of freshmen come in in the beginning. But little by little, you know, some peter out and some stop showing up. So how do you, how would you sustain, what, was your, what would be your advice on sustaining membership? 
Yeah, just have events, be publicly out there, um, always trying to invite dialogue and discussion. Um, and look, our Turning Point USA chapter deserves a lot of credit for what they've done here tonight. And you guys do such a great job. I was just there a year and a half ago, two years ago, three years ago. I can't remember. Everything is a blur post 2020. It all just kind of comes as a blur. But you got to stay engaged. You got to make it interesting. And then, you know, try to invite as many speakers as you can to campus. And then everyone loves a good debate. Yeah. When you're looking for something to do, try to have a debate. Dialogue, disagreement is always the best thing you could do. And we'd love to have you back. <laughs> hey, I'll put it on the list. I went to Clemson last year, so I got to yeah. atone for that, right? Sound, so yes, yes. I know. You're shocked. Hey. I won't do that again anytime We're soon. I love Clemson. Them. Great We're going to beat them this year. We are. Mark my words. Uh. Right. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Hello. Uh, I just want you to ask this, answer this one question. Do you understand that as a white man, you do not have to apologize for being white? You just have to acknowledge the racism that happens around you. That is all. What racism happens around me? Let's say, let's say that a racist police officer shoots me, right, and kills me, right? Um, for you to be a white man and you see that and don't say anything about say anything about it, I believe that my community would be upset about that. Now, all you have to do as a white man, you don't have to get on the internet or on Twitter and say, I'm sorry for being white, but you should, you should at least acknowledge the racism that happens around you. Okay, well, yeah, that, if an individual act of racism happens. That is, that is just taking, um, accountability for what happens well, around Hold on a second. First of all, I, I don't have to be accountability for a whole race, do I? Why do I have to be accountable for the white race? For yourself. Right. So if I'm racist, I'll take responsibility you, for you that. You probably are not racist. But, well, thank you. So then why but, do I have to but, comment on somebody else's racism? Uh, but what you do, what you should do is take accountability for the racism around you. Not pretend, not pretend that it doesn't happen around you. Like, again, the example that I gave you, that if I was shot by a police officer, who, a police officer and you found out that person was racist, right? Now, what would Why you, would what you, you said take responsibility? Should, How should, can I take what, responsibility for somebody else's what actions? What you should do is just take accountability and say, hey, no. yes, that was racist. Instead of saying, no, that person, that officer wasn't racist. Well, hold on. What, you got to show me an instance, an example, but okay. we're talking about such a micro problem that doesn't exist. Do you know that a black person is 18 and a half times more likely to shoot and kill a police officer than a police officer is to go and shoot an unarmed black man? But is that the question that I asked you? No, no, you it? asked a hypothetical about so, if I'm going to take so accountability again, for so, a racist so again, police officer. So again, but so I mean, you understand is, if I inverted it on you, would you take accountability for all the blacks killing police in America? That was funny. No, would you? That, no. That Why was, don't you take listen, accountability for listen, all the blacks listen, killing listen, police listen, in New York? I wouldn't, I wouldn't take accountability for it, but what I would say is, yes, there are a lot of black people in my community who do dumb things to other black people and to other white people. What I would not do is just pretend that it doesn't happen so that, like I said, you as a white man has to do the same thing. You I should. acknowledge it happens. Yeah. I also acknowledge that's it. it's that, rarer that's than it. lightning that's striking is, you that is all. when that, you're outside. That's, that's it. But let me ask you, is who is Tony Timpa? That's all I wanted you to that's all I wanted you to do. Thank you. I acknowledge it's Thank rare you. and I'm not gonna have to take responsibility for an entire race at all. It's wrong and it's terrible. I wish we could have continued the conversation. Hello, how are you? Oh Okay, sorry. Oh, um, I would like to say thank you for coming to UNC Charlotte. Mm -hmm. I do have a um, question about you about cannabis. You probably don't get many questions about yeah. cannabis. Um, so I would uh, like to ask you about your stance on cannabis and then follow up with sure. uh, a following um, question. Probably in the past overly policed but should not be legalized. Should not be legalized. And is it, uh, what is the reasons why you don't believe, or you believe it should stay illegal? Yeah, now so we have an overwhelming amount of data to show when it's legalized, states get more dangerous, it gets messier, more homelessness, more vagrancy, more overdoses, more kids going on drugs, more heroin overdoses. It is a gateway drug, regardless what people say. It's laced with chemicals, with fentanyl, with hallucinogenics. Colorado went from the 10th in carjackings to first in carjackings, fourth in arson to the first in arson. 
third in rape to the second in rape. I mean, I could go through every statistic. Every state that has legalized weed has seen more crime, more vagrancy, more dropouts, more kids on the social outcast of society. Uh, would you say that when you legalize marijuana, you can see the lab tests, you can see uh, all the toxic chemicals inside of uh, the cannabis uh, plant, you can see how much THC is in there, how much CBD, what terpenes, if it has limonene, pinene, myrcene, there's a, lots of, uh, um, there's a lot of cannabinoids inside Sounds of Sounds terrible. No, 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 it's actually good. It's actually quite unique because there are different strains with different types of benefits. Some people take it recreationally. Some t people take it uh, for medical purposes. So um, why not we legalize it so it's safer for our community, so people know what they're consuming, and also that also we um, uh, take marijuana off of the uh, schedule, well, the... Um, yeah, the, 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 the drug, I, yes. yes. To make it federally legal so you federally can make it. Legal. Let me ask you this. So you say, why not? Can you give me an example of any state that has legalized weed and it's gotten safer? And it's gotten safer? Yeah. So my knowledge is basically based on um, not necessarily, my, my question is not basically about if whether, about that statistics, but, but you based said on. You said safer. I mean, that would be probably critical, well, right? Well, safer in terms of consumption, in terms of what you're consuming, if it has, if it has um, toxic chemicals. When yeah, but guess what? You know, people still buy illegal weed despite the fact there's weed dispensaries on the corner in Vegas and in Denver. You don't get rid of the illegal drug market. You only enhance them to go to harder drugs and things they can't get in the store itself. There's more drug use in America than ever before, and we've legalized more drugs than ever before. It's been the great failure of the drug project the last 10 years. Every promise they've made is wrong. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to weaken the cartels. No, it's not. They're stronger than ever. Oh, we're going to get all this drug revenue. Actually, not really. There's more, there's more need for revenue because of the services that we can't even facilitate because of all the drugs. Or how about this one? They're like, oh, yeah, it's better because kids are passing drugs in school. Yeah, now they're passing fentanyl in school, no longer weed in school. And so not only that, the crime, the vagrancy, the homelessness, the defecation, everywhere it's legalized has gotten more dangerous, period. So why would we want to bring that to our communities? So it's not, so that's, that's not what I'm asking. That's, that's not what I was uh, basically talking about here. What I'm talking about is basically the consumption of the safetiness about, of people who consume cannabis. And also there, there are many, many, lots of good benefits too in terms of a lot there are a lot of good terpenes in terms of limonene um also pining uh actually yeah can i ask you when was the last time you did weed man <laughs> hmm? huh when was the last time you did weed um well i may not answer that question yeah i think rather recently <laughs> hey hey but but we still respect each other for we, our... we do and thank you for being a walking commercial to not do drugs thanks for being here tonight don't do hard drugs. I know you were all thinking it too as he was asking the question. I could feel it. All right. Well, Charlie, it's, uh, it's an honor to be speaking with you. Uh, you're a great inspiration of mine. Uh, I would love to be in your field one day, kind of doing what you do, as well as the other guy that was talking about running for office. I think that one thing that makes it very difficult a lot of times is that we live in a society that doesn't promote doing things differently like you didn't go to college and you know you're very uh, adamant against the college scam but as well as different aspects as we live in a world that is just very aggressive towards a lot of those different things and like for me as a high schooler with a lot of steps I take you know kind of get in that field whether it be uh, going to council meetings or uh, mm -hmm. doing a podcast different things like that what would you say that whether it be a piece of literature or maybe social networking cues to pick up on that would really enhance, maybe not enhance, but mm -hmm. help you kind of beat that system? Yeah, so look, you're talking about how to get into politics basically, right, in some ways? Yes, yeah, socially. Here's the cool thing about politics. It's a meritocracy. You show up early, you stay late, you're going to get rewarded. And anyone, I know there's some people running for office here tonight. Glad you guys are here. They're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for people to help them. They're looking for people to show up early on Saturday to go knock on doors. Be eager and willing. Do not be above any job. So the kind of overgeneralized story of Turning Point USA doesn't mention 
that, you know, in high school, I knocked on 100,000 doors for some candidates in Illinois. That's, you got to cut your teeth doing that, right? You got to knock on doors. You got to make phone calls. You got to get in the grassroots. It's the, in, in politics, the cool thing is no one cares you went to school. No one cares your degrees. No one cares about that stuff. They care about how much work you've put in. That's the best advice I could give you. You will move up so quickly in politics if you get early, get in early, stay late, and don't complain. Those three things. Get in early, stay late, and don't complain. That's the best piece of advice Thank I you. have for you. Thank you. And if you disagree, you guys can get preference. I know our wonderful staff is helping out. Hello, how are you? Hi, good evening. First of all, thank you for saying yes to the call that God has placed in your life, okay? <laughs> to congratulations to your beautiful bundle of joy. Savor every moment because it flies, okay? Um, I have a direct quote from Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. That is a direct quote. So my question is, knowing that abortion takes the lives of babies of all colors and ethnic backgrounds, but understanding it's the black genocide of today, right, it is. hands down. What have you discovered to be the most effective or creative way to combat the lies regarding this genocidal agenda? I like you. <laughs> She's great. It is black genocide, and thank you for saying that out loud. I say that and the media loses their mind. Yeah. But it disproportionately impacts the black community. Life is beautiful, and life yeah. begins at conception. And we are seeing disproportionate amount of abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood clinics, and the founder was a eugenicist, yeah. period. The founder of Planned Parenthood was a eugenicist. Yeah. Now, are the current leaders of it eugenicists? We don't know, but if you were trying to exterminate the black population, how would you do things any differently than what Planned Parenthood is doing right exactly. now? So how do we go back against it? We gotta play offense. We gotta explain the pro-life issue. We gotta talk about why life is beautiful. And honestly, we also gotta step up, those of us that are Christians and conservatives, with the resources, the charities, the services, to make sure that we get rid of the myth of unwanted children. There is not an unwanted child in America. We just need to make sure people that are in crisis, that are pregnant, are able to find adoption services, find the services necessary. That's the way I lead on it. But honestly, I yield back to Malcolm X, who number one, did call it a black, black genocide. Yeah. And I don't, I don't agree with Malcolm X on everything, everything, but you know what else? You know who he blamed? The white liberal, yeah. and he was right. Yeah, this is a yeah. tyranny of the white liberal yeah. going after the black community. Yeah, Let me just kind of ask you a question in closing yeah. here. What is your message to white liberals out there that are trying to push this in the black community? Um, that, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that um, if you don't do the research and if you don't understand, then shut up. Do the research. No, I'm serious. Do the do, work. Do the work. Uh, understand why that over, I think is 88% of Planned Parenthoods are strategically placed in black and minority neighborhoods. Why? Let's reverse engineer. Why is it like in the uh, state of New York, there are more black babies being murdered in the womb than are alive? So the words of Marcus Sanger has turned out to be prophetic. And also, the abortion agenda is a multi-billion dollar industry. There is money in dead baby parts. You can find it. It was found in food, cosmetics everywhere so this is the facts this is the truth give it up for her that's great give it up for her evening Hi, um my question is, uh, who killed Dr. King? Dr. King. Name escapes me. The name? The, the name escapes me, yeah. But yeah. I believe it, I mean, yeah, name escapes me. Yeah. Okay, so would you say it could be the FBI? Could be. Would you say that it is the FBI? Not definitively, but I certainly don't trust the FBI after recent years, so I'm open-minded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, another point you made earlier. Uh, what do you think about separation of church and state? 
Um, doesn't exist. It shouldn't exist. Yeah. Shouldn't exist? Yeah. So you should have church in the state? Well, first, where in the Constitution does it say that? We the can't first have that. amendment. Where? Uh, it's about the religion, right? So there's no exception of religion. Mm -hmm. There's no exception. It doesn't say that. Yes, it does. It says Congress shall make no law establishing religion yeah, yeah. or prohibiting the exercise thereof. Where does it say church and state? Religion. Well, hold on. It says that Congress shall make no official religion or prohibiting the exercise thereof. Where does it say that the church can't get involved in the state? It could be involved, but it can't be the religion established. Hold on. We're talking about two different things then, yeah, right? Yeah, no, see, like, because what you're saying is that, oh, you can be a Christian and be in the government. And that's true. That's how it works right now. You can be a Christian and be in the government, right? But you cannot establish Christianity as the basis of... Well, no, that's not what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that Christians should be in the government and the church should be actively involved. Where do we get that phrase, separation of church and state, from? The First Amendment. No, we don't. No, it's, Th it's Thomas Jefferson writing to the Danbury Baptist Convention in Massachusetts, uh -huh. assuring them that the church would not come after the state. So let me ask you a question. Let's pretend that church and state is the law of the land, right? That the Warren Court and the Burger Court argued in the 1950s and 1960s. Then why on earth did we put up with the government going around and shutting down churches during the pandemic? I thought we need separation of church and state. Mm. Why is it that the government can go and yeah. shut down churches? Okay, so they aren't they supposed shutting, to be separate? I actually played for a church. I played drum set, right? So I would go to church, and uh, they're not shutting churches because of you know COVID. They're saying that oh, it's unsafe to be in public. Like, but they shouldn't have the right to do it because I thought they're supposed to be separate, right? Yeah. I mean, for general safety. I mean, if you, if you want people like dying, then oh, so you could shut them down for safety. So it's not separate. It's like we can come they, in for whatever reason we deem necessary okay. to restrict your religion not restricting you can practice from on camera we we played like through live stream and like online yeah this so watching church right on right a right? live stream is like watching a fireplace on tv you could see everything with no uh, warning okay but if god is real all the time and you can't go to church because of a disease going around what does it say in the bible about do not forsake the gathering of believers where two or more are gathered in my name okay so what does it say about conception when what does it begin huh conception or when it's uh i'm sorry life again at conception, of course. Yeah. I, I thought it said at first breath. No, it actually doesn't say that. So What's the, the verse? Well, hold on. First of all, it says, I knew you before you were in the womb. Yeah. And what you are doing is paraphrasing what you consider to be ex nihilo, out of nothing, made in the image of God, the breath of God, with actually where life begins. So the question would be, was John the Baptist a baby when he, le when he leapt in, in Elizabeth's womb? Was he? Are you a Christian? Me? Yeah. Am I? You play drums at a church, so I hope you're a Christian. <laughs> um, but you're, you're missing the point, so it sounds like. No, no, I'm actually not missing I mean, the I point. I asked you the, the verse that says that it begins at conception. Right, so I knew you before you were in the womb is one of many verses of which it reinforces that you should protect life in the womb. But, but, but you're, what you're doing is interpreting, right? So I want you to tell me where no, it I'm, says I'm re I'm life reading. begins at. You're, how are you reading? There's no book. He, there, there's no book? Uh, it, it's, I've memorized scripture. You should try it. So, you, so you're reading it in your brain right now? Well, well, no. In Jeremiah, it says very clearly, I knew you before you were in the womb. Yeah. So when it says in the Bible that question begins at first breath. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't. You're, then you, what does it say? You're misquoting it very clearly. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts, it says. You wove me in my mother's womb, it says. Mm -hmm. I will give thanks to you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Fearfully, wonderfully made, and my inward works. That sounds like a baby in the womb, doesn't it? Yeah, well, a fetus in the womb. A fetus in the womb? Yeah. What species is that fetus? A fetus? Species. So what species is that fetus? Human. So it would be a human life? Yeah, you know, would would be eventually. Oh, but when does it become a human life then? When it's born, when it breathes. Oh, really? So that a 26-week-old preemie baby that is saved because of a cesarean section isn't a baby until it comes out of the womb? I mean, if it's born, it's born. So you believe that we should be able to terminate a pregnancy up until the moment of birth? Did I say that? I'm asking. No. Okay, so then what restriction on abortion would you give? Well, if the, the woman who was giving birth is going to die... Which then, never happens. Which nev never happens. That's right. So, so That's right. It is a mythology Ohio, that women will die if they have a baby. That's that right. They, they, you could they, talk to entire communities of OBs. You know why? Because if cesarean option is entertained, 
then you could save both the mother and the baby. Instead, the abortion industry lies to the mother, and they say that you must terminate the baby to save the mother's life. So you could talk to the... hundreds of Christian OBs and non-Christian OBs, and they will tell you that is a mythology of the abortion industry. Mm. You know what? That's, that's, that's funny. Uh, no, it's actually not way, funny. No, no, the, the, no, I'm saying you. The way you represent facts, like willingly and knowingly. I'm sorry? The way you, like, you knowingly like, represent facts. You say, oh, okay, uh, abortion... Oh, it's it's terrible because oh, you can't possibly save the baby and you can't possibly save the mother at the same time. It happens. The ten-year-old in Ohio, right? Yes, a cesarean section could have saved the baby's life and the mother's life. Do you know what a cesarean section is? Do you? Yes, my wife had one. Oh, okay, just good for you. I'm saying when the baby, right? So, do you know what a cesarean baby? section is or no? I honestly don't know. Yeah, so I, I would. Here's a little word to the wise. Let's quit while you're ahead. A cesarean section is a medical intervention that saves tens of thousands of lives every single year of a small slit done at the, bo at the top of a, a woman's pelvis. Yeah, cesarean oh, a section. That's a C-section, oh, okay. abbreviated, all right? Oh, wow. So maybe you, that's, that's where we get the term C-section from. So oh, guess wow. what? If every woman that's lied to by Planned Parenthood was given a C-section instead of an abortion, so then all of a sudden abortion would not be necessary to save their life. Them. Every single one of them. If you talk to hundreds of OBs across the country, they will say medical necessary abortion is a lie. So period. You're 10 years End old, of story. Right? And you're pregnant, right? You're 10 years old and pregnant, okay? So you really can't give birth through your, your womb. You can't give so birth to that. So you do a C section. How? You cut them wanted? open and you lift the baby up and everyone lives. How does the baby survive? Hopefully through a work of God and Hopefully. also medical technology that is the most common surgery in America. So. I'll kind of close Most with this and then we'll get to the next question because we're running low on time. When does life begin? At first breath. At first breath. That moral standard of first breath would therefore believe that you could have abortion up until the life, up until the moment of birth. Life begins at conception. I'm going to say this as nicely as I possibly can. You're a drummer at a church. You should probably reconsider that because you are advocating for the most horrific and brutal eugenic non-Christian abortion policies that I could possibly imagine. I hope you prayerfully reconsider and repent. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Hello, darling. My name is James Friday. Uh, I am, first of all, I want to completely second everything my sister just said. That was really good. And then, um, no, 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 she, she was no, 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 she, like, I was, it was a figure of speech. <laughs> The black girl that was up here. <laughs> so, uh, I have an advice question and a uh, request. In a request, so the first one is: Do you have any advice about medical school and law school? Like, I'm, I want to do that, and so like, which one to go to? Because it's really terrible. Like the University yeah. of Michigan. It's and all bad that out there. And Liberty Yale. University has a pretty good the nursing pro program. The DL program. I heard about that. Yale. No, no, no. D the DL program. Oh yeah, yeah. No, they do. That, that, I'm sorry. I thought you said Yale. I, Misheard. Yes, yeah, but yeah. D Liberty has a, a better one uh, than most schools, and they're not woke. They're really strong and conservative, and, and they do a great job. You should give it up. Liberty does a nice job. So, but the list is very, very minimal. Um, even Baylor has gone totally off the rails, that's unfortunately. My first one. I just, but, I, that was, could you know it's alphabetical order? That was the first one I had. For law, so. <laughs> but Baylor's not the worst. Okay. Just if you want to go to medical school, don't go to Michigan. I mean, I, I love our Michigan fans out there. They're great people, but they've gone so off the rails woke, unfortunately. Here's the big thing. Get involved with your turning point group. Stay, get a good church community. Get through it as quickly as possible. I think you're going to make a great lawyer or doctor, whatever you end up both, doing. Both. 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 Good both. for you, man. Yeah, yeah. That's so, awesome. And then... You got an ask really quick. We got to keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we'll take can, a couple more, but yeah. Can I, be, can I be on your show? Can I be on my show? Can, can I be on your show? Well, you already are because you're no, here right now. No, no, so. but like podcasts and all that. Possibly. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll all right. talk. All right. all right. Thank you. All right. A couple more. Um, I'm a student here at UNC Charlotte, and I just had a question. Uh, you have claimed to support free speech and right to assembly. Then why was Brandy Love kicked out of a Turning Point USA event in Tampa, Florida in July of 2021? Right. So Brandy Love is a pornography actress, and we have minors at our event, and I will defend to anybody in any venue or forum, not allowing people that spread or participate in pornography to be commingling or socializing around minors. Well, <laughs> well the clothes that Brandy was wearing and the, and the, the conversation she was having had nothing to do with her pornography. Yeah, I don't care. If you participate job. in pornography, you're not going to be around young children. I'm not going to endorse that as an organizer. I'm not going to act like that's normal and that it's okay. 
If you engage in something that so many young men struggle with, that are addicted to, that are destroying marriages, I consider you to be a willful participant in a parasitic force in America, and that does not have a place at a Turning Point USA event. Yeah. Uh, I disagree, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much Thanks. for coming on campus. Appreciate it. All right, the last question. Make it good. I'll try to keep it spicy for y'all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What's up, Charles, man? You're on record for stating, and I quote, this is the gayest generation of America. What are your overall thoughts on this? Because some of your opponents seem to believe you have homosexual tendencies. Um, well, it is the gayest generation ever. Every fact shows that more young people are gay than any other generation. So is there something you'd like to tell me, or do you want to just read off a phone and parrot some of the Oh, no, I mean, I, mean I, I wrote down that question, obviously, because yeah. uh, it was a quote. So, I mean, I didn't want to mess it up and yeah. then you come for me or anything like that. So like I said, man, what are your overall thoughts on that? On my thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I think my record of my marriage speaks for itself. But is there something you want to tell us about I mean, your own? I mean, you don't got to accuse me of being gay. Just because you're married don't mean that you're not homosexual yourself. Well, you came up here asking about the gayest generation. I got some questions about you, man. And I mean, yeah, man. I mean, you're, you're, coming, you're, coming to, you're coming to my campus that I represent calling us, you know, one of the gayest generations well, it is. in America. One I mean, out yeah. of five young and, people and are I'm, lesbian, and gay, or trans. And even though, even though I don't. It's the gayest generation ever. Congrats, man. Uh, Congrats? No, it's not I mean, a good thing, actually. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, my point is you're coming to our campus, you know, obviously saying that. And, no, I didn't you know, say it. You yeah, repeated no, you it, but did, I'm happy no, to you defend say, it. No, you did say it. You did well, quote it. Well, no, not early in my speech, but I'm okay. happy to repeat well, yeah, it. Not, yeah, not in your speech, obviously. Yeah, it, yeah. it is the gayest generation in American history. That's a fact. Do you disagree with that? No, I, I don't disagree with that because I feel like we've been then able what's to... the question here? <laughs> my question was just what are your overall thoughts on the quote and, you know... <laughs> my thought, I defend the quote. Okay. Cool, cool. Appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. Internet's going to love that one. Yeah, you'll be real famous in about 20.